Should I jump into it then? Oh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, so, um, my name is Norm Bixen. Uh, uh, I'm actually an engineer, uh, but I work on GSS technology, and that's what I'm going to be talking to you about, but try to address really clinically relevant questions um, related to TDCS dose. And that's really like, if you have a patient like this with this kind of indication and this kind of issues, where do you place the electrodes? It's a very basic question. Um, and so I'm going to try to give you an answer uh, to that question. Um, Okay. Um, so you've had already half of the day of lecture on TDCS, so you know what it is. It was a basic level. It's sort of like a bunch of sponges with a 9 volt battery. I mean, it's not that, but it's convenient to think about that. You know, even Albert had a little picture with a 9 volt battery uh, hooked onto it, and you know, there's all this press about it. Um, but I think the thing that people taking this course are interested in is the use of it for neuropsychiatric disorders. I think that's even the title of the course. Uh, but there's also issues in, in rehab, not just stroke, but other forms of rehab. And um, there's just a lot of papers. This is not even an up-to-date chart. And it's kind of being used for you know everything, right? Everything and, and some other kind of thing. And um, that's not really necessarily a good thing. Right, because it kind of it makes you very uneasy. Just like if you had a pill that worked for everything, you'd probably say, "Yeah, probably it works for nothing." And that's you know what I mean. It's more likely, you know. I mean, it's kind of like snake oilish. And so that's the question we're going to be talking about: is how could one thing really be good for so many things? It doesn't make any sense. Uh, you know, or is it, is it, is it, it maybe it does make sense, but it does make you a little bit uneasy. And I'm going to be um, essentially saying that well. It has a lot to do with where you deliver the current, per indication. And so this question of where you put the pads is, is really important. It's really central to making this a rational technique and not, and not something that we should be feeling uneasy about. So I think it's a pretty important question. Um, and I'm going to just jump uh, a few of these slides. And so one basic idea is that TDCS is not one thing, and, and you've already seen that. In fact, with TDCS, you, you can pick your pad. You can pick its size, so it can be a big pad or it can be a little pad. And now you have multiple pads, so you're picking the number of pads that you have, and you're picking the size and shape of each one, and then you pick where you put them. And so if you're thinking about like an EEG 1020 system, just with two pads, you have hundreds of combinations of where one goes and where the other one goes, not even including the size, then you can add multiple pads, and then you can think about how much current you're gonna put on them. And if you have more than two pads, you can actually have multiple levels of current. So actually, it's an incredibly flexible technique. It is not one thing, and that, I think any discussion of it, sort of, uh, of how you would, you would rationally optimize it for anything begins with that recognition. It's not one thing. And when you change, what I'll, what I'll explain to you is that when you change the pad position, when you change the amount of current going through it, even with just DC, not even AC, like we're talking about next, it's a different intervention. It's a giving someone, it's the same thing as giving someone a different drug. It's that, it's that different as far as what it might do to the brain. And so it's not one thing. These are different doses, and these are different drugs. And so TDCS dose is the number of electrodes, the shape of electrodes, their location, right, and how much current you put in. And um, there's a lot of options. And so where do you put them, given that? Uh, and there's another, there's like a flip, flip way to think about this question, which is that if you have a brain target, you don't really care where you put the pads. What really is usually the situation is you have a target, let's say premotor, motor, uh, prefrontal, something, and you just want to know where do I need to put my electrodes to get the current there, right? Now, when you say that, there's something built into what you're saying, which is that you're assuming you can do that. You're assuming that by putting the pads where you want, you can get the current to where you need it to be. And now we start talking about specificity. So if it's depression, you deliver the current to just the prefrontal. If it's a seizure that's initiating in motor, you inhibit just the motor. And so if it's migraine, maybe you go to a target that you think is associated with migraine. And, so that, and, and there's other permutations beyond it. So that's really the question. Given the target, how do you design the montage? And that's what I'll be talking about. Um, I'll skip this too. Um, so 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with like the simple version, and then it's going to be all wrong. But that's sometimes useful, right? <laughs> but I kind of wanted to tell you that up front so that, because sometimes, you know, the people raise their hand and I have to say you're right. But this is the simple version. So this is, I'm going to be showing the results from, from computer models that make predictions of current flow. And I'm not, I'm not uh, going to be like getting into the, the, the details of it. These are, these are simulations that guess what's happening in the head because whatever, you can't rip people's heads open and look, right? So you have to use these models. But they're MRI derived. This is your example, right? So it kind of looks like me, so it's somewhat accurate. And I have two electrodes on me. Um, they're five by five centimeter pads. And one has been placed here and one has been placed here. This one is the anode and this one is the cathode, and that's you know the fancy term for the thing connected to the positive terminal of the battery and the thing connected to the negative terminal of the battery. So when this happens, my head is part of the circuit. My head is part of this electrical circuit, and as a result of that, current is going to flow across my head. Now it's going to flow from the left side to the right side, because that's current flows from the positive to the negative. And so if I look just under the head, this is a model, uh, in which parts of the brain are getting current, it's largely under the electrodes, but not exactly. So it's kind of spreading out a little bit, right? So it's coming in on one side here, and it's coming out on the other side. But it's not the same thing on both sides, and I think you've heard about that this morning, right? It's not the same thing. Because on this side, on the brain, I see current showing up, right? Current is arriving, and if I'm the, the um, the gray matter, current is crossing me this way. And if I'm the brain here, it's like current's leaving me. And if I'm the gray matter, current passes the other way. And it turns out that this is pretty important, or people think this is very important, the TDCS dose, and you've already heard that today, right? So that's where that notion sort of comes from. Um, you know, why is that? Well, um, Alva already mentioned uh, this notion of thinking about how cells are shaped. And this is an example of a cortical neuron, a cortical pyramid, a uh, pyramidal cell. Uh, and they have this thing where they have this, you know, the soma, and that the dendrite is not really symmetrical. It's like this thing sticking out. They tend to look like that often. There's different cells, but some cells look like that. I mean, this is a cartoon, but they look like that. And so if you have a positive electrode on the top, I explain that if you're that part of the brain, it's like current is showing up. You're seeing current show up. And so if this is like the head, and this is like you know, your butt, so the current is going to show up from like the, the, the I, I shouldn't say butt, apical dendrite is like the <laughs> technical term, right? From the apical dendrite, and it's going to be flowing down like this, right? And you can see that if it was the cathode, it'd be the other way. So I'll show you that picture in a second. So the current flows in, and it turns out that some of this current will flow like around the cell, but some of it will pass through the cell. And it will flow into the dendrite, and it will flow out of the soma. And it turns out that because of Ohm's law, this part of the cell will be hyperpolarized, and this part of the cell will be depolarized. <coughs> um, and it's really important to keep this in mind. Uh, so it's not like there, it's the cell. It's, it's important not to say that cells are being depolarized under the anode. That's impossible. But you can say that the soma is being hyperpolarized. And people will, again, this is like the simple version of the story. People will say, well, the soma is what matters. We can ignore the dendrite. And if the soma is depolarized, this cell is more excitable. All its neighbors are more excitable. And they'll extrapolate even further and say that for that reason, the cell is more prone to plasticity. And there are so many ifs and qualifiers in that line of reasoning, but that you have to start with like the simple version of the story uh, to get there. And so under cathode, it's the opposite. Current is flowing up, it's exiting the brain. So the opposite happens. The soma is hyperpolarized, and people will like to assume, somewhat simplistically, but there's a basis for this, right? That this part of the brain will become less excitable. And so really, you're <coughs> saying anode is soma depolarizing at the cortex. Cathode is soma hyperpolarizing at the <coughs> cortex. That's, that's worked out really well. And then all these other things like making you smarter or curing your epilepsy somehow derive from that with a lot of ifs. So um, sometimes this could be called the somatic doctrine because it's really based on like thinking about the soma. And I had to talk about that because it gets to the heart of why anode is excitatory and why cathode is inhibitory. And 
you could assume that there, if there's another part of the brain where there's no current flow, well, that's not going to be hyperpolarized and that's not going to be depolarized. Just, that's just going to be spared. So the, per, the portions with um, inward current flow are the excitable regions. The, the portions with outward current flow are the inhibitory regions. And the middle are in between. So this montage was used in, in a study uh, in a collaboration with Branch Coslett's group in, at University of Pennsylvania. And they did something that sort of made people read better. And they had a reason for doing that. Um, but I'm not going to get into any clinical findings. Okay, so this is where it all falls apart, right? The part where I tell you, <laughs> if only it was so simple, then they wouldn't ask me to give this talk, right? They would just say that. So this is an example. This was with a group at Yale. And now the montage is a little bit more complicated. It kind of looks like, this is again me and this is simulated, but it looks like these these like two little like horns, and they're in different positions. So these are going to be the anodes, and we're going to have two now, and they're going to be small. Now, this is the cathode. Right? Uh, but in this case, we're also going to call it the return. When people say return, they just mean the one they don't want you to think about. That's what it means. Right? Active is the one they want you to think about, and cathode is the one they would like you not to pay attention to, because it's, it, it, help, it makes their story, you know, it's harder for them to publish their paper. It's, and they'll admit it. They'll admit it, right? There is no return. You know what I mean? Um, so here's the active, and here's the return. And what's being shown here, there's a, there's a, in a sense, there's a lot of troubling things in this picture. The first one is, you know, the, the general goal with this group was to target the prefrontal region. Well, certainly if you look at row D, it's very hard to argue that this is stimulation of prefrontal. In fact, it looks like you're stimulating the whole head. Well, why is that? Well, because current's going to come in here, and it's going to enter the head, and it's going to flow all the way across. It is not going to enter and then just disappear. Right? And somehow gets sucked up by the return. Of course it's going to flow all the way across. And so you're going to get a, a pattern that looks like this. You'll also see in this case that here under the return, you have a lot of activity. Is it a good idea to ignore that in this montage? And you can see how concentrated that will get. And so when you're looking at it in the case of the um, blue square, if you can make out this blue square, C, D, and E, the return is in the same position, but the active is being moved from here to here to here. <clears throat> so look what a difference it makes. It even makes a difference on the return. So the position, and then if you look at the uh, red square, there the active has been fixed in this position, and the return is moving. And depending on where you put that black return, whether you put it you know, near the apex, or on the mastoid, the current flow is totally different, including under the active electrode. So what do we see? First of all, there's also many montage variations. Even with this simplified, you know, just bifrontal small anode return, right? There's a lot of little variations. And they make a huge difference. That if you choose unwisely, you can actually miss your target. So it's not, I'm not talking about necessarily just like optimizing. I'm talking about you're not getting current to your target, one way or the other. And the other thing is they're kind of interacting. Like you can't just plop these down where you want and stick this on the arm, on the back of the head, don't worry about it. And all these things are sort of obvious in retrospect. And so when you are designing your TDCS montage, you're looking at your TDCS montage in totality. You're not just putting your active electrode, active, the one you want to think about, where you want it in the other one. And so, and so these are important things to think about. Um, and so we come back to this notion of TDCS dose, which is uh, the things that you control. And I think it's really useful to think of this in terms of like uh, drugs. So in drugs, the dose is what you give the patient. It's what you have control over as far as what you deliver to them. You don't have control over anything else. The same thing is with TDCS. Dose is what you can control. Now, it turns out that the active is very different, right? In the case of a drug, if it's a drug that's supposed to help them with, you know, temporal lobe epilepsy, everyone knows that the amount of grams that are in that drug that's, you know, injected systemically is not what's going to show up in the hippocampus. No one's going to say that if, you, if they swallow one milligram, you should, one milligram shows up in the hippocampus. Of course it's not the same because the body's in the middle. The exact same happens with TCS. TCS, the dose is what you apply on the outside. 
What is delivered on the inside is what I've been showing you. That's the current flowing through the brain. The two are not the same. Yes, you control this, but you need to be cognizant of this. And so the pictures I've been showing you, these models, they do just that. They show for what's on the outside, this is what you get on the inside. And that's why I'm talking about these models, right? They show outside to inside. They show you, if you put this on the outside, what do you get on the inside? If you put something else on the outside, what do you get on the inside? And so that's why you should use these models as part of my explaining, you know, one of my goals here, is that you shouldn't just, well, I hope it'll be obvious as we'll go through it, right? And so I'm gonna be showing you how. And I'm gonna be talking about some other issues that come up. One of them is, um, should everyone get the same thing? Now with drugs, the answer is no, right? You know, you, you, you adjust the amount of, of drug that you give because Again, what's on the outside is not the same as what's on the inside, it's affected by the body. Um, in the case of TCS, it's really obvious. You have very large variations. These are to scale. Um, variations in anatomy, right? Should um, uh, this lady, whose head is you know, half the size of mine, very low um, uh, body fat, et cetera, skull half as thick as mine, should she receive the same amount of TCS as me? Right? I mean, it's a very, and, 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 and it's a very important question that, that sort of an extreme version of that would be in pediatrics. So currently right now in pediatric TCS, there is no dose adjustment uh, for kids. Uh, these kids can go be down to a few years old. Um, and so, I mean, I'm going to end up saying no, they should not get the same thing, but I'll show you what, what's convenient is these models allow you to do that. These models allow you to say, okay, in a kid, when I give this much on the outside, how much shows up on the inside, and how does that relate to adults? And so the models can do that, and I'm not gonna talk about the methodology, um, other than to say that you know, every model starts with high resolution MRI scans, and the tissue is divided inside the computer simulation into the different masks. So this is an example of, of, of what I've been showing you so far. This is um, my head. This is, you know, it's a 1020 EEG system, but these are also high definition electrodes that I'll talk about. Um, and though this is an older model, you can, all, you can already start to see the level of, of resolution that's captured, you know, down to um, my teeth, the CSF, and the brain. And, and you can see here we're talking about um, uh, gyri, sub gyri level questions. And that's really it, the, the level that uh, I'm going to be showing you results at. You can go obviously deep into the brain and if this works. And what's nice is I can take these models and I can say, all right, I'm going to simulate giving all these different people the exact same montage. And I'm going to see how much arrives at their brain. And that addresses this question of should everyone get the same amount of TDCS? There's different reasons, other reasons why everyone should not get the same amount. Like if you have epilepsy, maybe you shouldn't get the same amount. But a very basic question is if we put the exact same electrodes on everyone in this room, will some people get 10 times more current than other people? And if that's the case, that person getting 10 times more shouldn't get one milliamp, they should get a tenth of a milliamp. And then the models will show you how to achieve that. Um, okay, so let me start with this one montage. This is um, two pads. This is the anode, and that's the cathode, or the return, if you want to call it that. And these pads are pretty large. They're five by seven centimeters square, and his head is rather small. Um, but I'm using it to prove a point, and I'll show you how the models can predict how the current flows through all these structures. But I'll be visualizing it on the surface of the brain, because that's what we often care about. I don't, we don't really care about how much current is in the skull. We care about how much is in the brain. So when you do this, and this montage, by the way, is not insignificant. This montage is the one that popularized TDCS, right? With the, like the clinical trials that were run here initially use this montage. So what happened inside the brain? Let's see if this will play. All right, this is what brain looks like. Now it's a false color map. Yellow shows the most activation. Red shows like half, and black shows none. And it's, it's very hard to look at what I just showed you. Here's a still picture of it. So red is maximum roughly, right? Orange is sort of halfway, uh, <coughs> sorry, 
white is maximum yellow, orange is halfway, and black is minimum. Though you could say that the active electrode is placed over M1, I don't think you would call this M1 stimulation. You would call this, I stimulated the whole head, right? Not just cortically, by the way, it's not cortically. There's no notion of superficial stimulation here. And certainly the frontal regions are not any more spirit than the others. Plus you see this like clustering, those little hot spots. And if you think about it, you know, this is what you'd expect, right? If you had a watermelon, I always do the watermelon analogy. If I took a watermelon and I put an electrode on one side and an electrode on the other side, you expect current to go through the whole watermelon, not just here. So that's the situation. And so these, many of these, not, I showed you an example before where it looked a little better, but many of these conventional TDCS montages um, go superficially. Um, they go, not that old play, but anyways, they, they, this is an example of some uh, deep brain targets, right? So TDCS is flowing, it's flowing all the way through the head. And so when you are using conventional, some conventional TDCS montages, you're stimulating half to a third of the brain and many deep brain structures. Now clinically, and I say deep just as a you know, sort of in that sense, this may be great, right? Like in this case, this was in, as, with a collaboration, this montage was used for headache. You may argue clinically, I'm really happy to stimulate half the brain. I'm not gonna say it's necessarily bad, but it's certainly important to be cognizant that this is what you're doing. And so of course, um, and we can look further, we can, look at, we can, we can use DTI, we can do tractography, but I'm gonna skip that uh, and talk about high definition TDCS and what value it provides. With high definition TDCS, you essentially replace the sponges, because TDCS usually uses like these, like they look like six sink sponges, right? You replace the sponges with small electrodes. So the electrodes themselves are called high definition electrodes and then you can arrange them in different montages. And so the 4X1 is a type of montage where there's a center anode and it's surrounded by four cathodes. And the hypothesis was that when you use this, current will enter under the anode and be collected by the cathodes, leading to an increase in focality. And this was initially evaluated in a model. And again, without getting into all the quantification, qualitatively, this does not look like what we were looking at before. Now you can say, well, maybe I didn't just stimulate M1, but maybe M1, premotor, a little bit of sensory. It's also much more superficial. So um, uh, it looks sort of like that, and then if we just look at side by side, uh, it's sort of obvious, right? And it's sort of obvious also if you think about it intuitively. I mean, when you do something like this, why is it focal? Well, because the current's not gonna enter here and do like that. I mean, there's no reason for it to do that. Current will flow locally. It's sort of like if I took two electrodes with a lot of voltage and I put it on here, well, your thumb would twitch, but this finger wouldn't because the current's gonna flow between the electrodes. And that's what's happening here. Um, something else interesting happens, which, which is that uh, normally with TCS, you're dealing with both an anode and a cathode. So you're, even though you wanna call one your return and you really wanna ignore it, you shouldn't. But with the 4X1 montage, you approach a very unidirectional form of modulation. And the reason is, is because the four electrodes split the middle. So if the middle has one, the outsides only have 0.25. On top of that, the current tends to return, return over a broader region. So it's not purely unidirectional, but it's rather unidirectional. Um, and so that is the, the 4X1. And again, I, I wanted to go back, I showed you that horrible example. There, you know, this montage, you could argue, is for a conventional TCS montage is not so bad. Though now we know that you're not just affecting the cortex, you're affecting everything in between as well. So I, I didn't, I didn't wanna make it seem like you can't do anything with conventional uh, stimulation. Um, okay, so what do you do with all this information, right? I mean, you know, how, how do you go about doing it? So we've been working a lot on disseminating different tools uh, one of them, you can find it here. This is the website, which by the way, all, these, all the stuff, you know, all the papers and everything, if you really want to dig into it, I'm flying through it, right? But you know, every slide has a paper. So the lab, lab is neuroengr.com. Uh, and then one of the applications we have is called Bonsai. And Bonsai is a program that is, um, you know, we make stuff that's very like graphically driven. This actually runs on your browser but you need Flash. So I don't know if it's gonna work on your iPad, but it's gonna work on anything with Flash. Um, and you can sit there and you literally click the electrodes, 
and it shows you where the current goes, and then if you don't like it, um, you can try something else. You can try extracephalic montages and see how bad they really are, right? So for a while, they were popular because people, people did not want an anode and a cathode. So they said, well, I'm going to use an anode, and I'm going to put my cathode on the outside so I can ignore it. But the currents, the, every, all the current that enters the brain has to come out. And so what you, what you had was an anode here and a big cathode at the bottom of the brain. Just because, you know I mean, it doesn't make the problem go away. So this lets you explore that. Um, and then tomorrow, oh, I have a, I, I, I split it on my first slide. I have a conflict of interest. I, the, there's a company called Soterics Medical that disseminates some of the technology I work for, and they're doing a demo tomorrow. Um, they have slightly slicker, they have more resources. They have slightly slicker software that does this as well. But this is pr free. So it's, might as well start there. Um, I talked about kids. I mean, the short version is yes. I'm, I, I think I'm very uncomfortable with trials uh, that are ongoing right now in pediatrics that do not pay any attention to this idea. Um, I mean, here's an example where this is one milliamp on me, whatever, this is some, some random montage, and this is one milliamp on a 12-year-old and an 8-year-old. These are otherwise healthy, healthy kids. And you can see how much more electric field is generated in their brain than in adults. Um, and maybe I have some videos here, but they don't really add any more information. But uh, it could be two to five-fold more. And so, I mean, maybe that's great. You know, maybe these kids are going to have five times more improvement in whatever it is you're looking for, right? But um, I think it's worth to be cognizant of what you're doing, that you are not... Just like you wouldn't give a you know, kid the same necessarily dose of a, of a pill, you could give them an adult dose, but know that you're giving a kid an adult dose. And dose, again, is what you put on the outside, not what shows up on the inside. Uh, and so the models can, can um, allow um, do dose titration uh, across these situations. Not bonsai, but, but other tools that I'll mention allow you to do that. Um, we have a collaboration here. There's a lot of interest in using uh, well, using TDCS for everything, as I mentioned, but one of the things is craving. This is like a super obese subject uh, that is part of the study uh, here. Um, and the question was, um, should this super obese subject get more current because they have all this fat? Because otherwise it's just gonna go around the head. Um, so th this was a very interesting study. The short answer was no. Not necessarily. It turns out that this subject, for example, um, uh, roughly is about roughly as sensitive as I am. The reason is, not that it doesn't matter, but as I learned through this study, people have very, very different shaped heads. We don't realize it, but when you start doing this stuff and doing measurements, and that in itself makes so much variability that the additional variability called by obesity is small. So meaning that the differences are in this room are so wide already, uh, at least two to three fold at least, that were we to add some super obese people, they wouldn't add to that variability, though they will be different. It, and it, gets, it boils down to something that are so basic, like even if you're positioning by 1020, just the distance is gonna be different, right, between the electrodes because of our head shape and the size and so on. Uh, and, 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 and the, again, everything is different. The, the, the fat is different. The skull, the thickness of the skull, the, the, the thickness of the CSF is very different across subjects. It, you could have several fold difference uh, across subjects, uh, never mind the shape of the brain and so on. And so when you do the same to different subjects, it doesn't look the same. Now all this being said, it's, it is obvious that currently the way TDCS is done in most clinical trials is everyone gets the same. So uh, that is obvious. Uh, at the same time, no one is comfortable with that. In TMS, um, it would be unheard of to do that because you always titrate to motor growth potential. It would, anybody doing a TMS trial would be like, there's no way I'm gonna give everyone the same thing. That's a recipe for failure. And so I think TCS has been successful despite this fact that it has not been titrated. Uh, but no one, I think, uh, would argue that you would have better outcomes potentially, or you might, well, of course, potentially you might have better outcomes 
with, with controlling it. And this is not like technology that you have to wait 20 years for. It's available now. It's a question of whether you choose or not to employ it into your trial. Uh, and so that's really the point, that um, you get greater than 2x variation across intensity. Well, anyways, I just typed this right now, but you get the idea. And, you know, you say, does 2x matter? Well, I mean, you have studies by like Michael Nietzsche's group that founded TDCS saying that if you double TDCS intensity, you can go from an excitatory effect to an inhibitory one, or from an inhibitory to excited one. So 2x is not a trivial, it's not like whatever, just a little bit more, a little bit less. <laughs> and Alvaro, in fact, showed you that, that amazing st study where they actually looked, usually people don't do this, but they looked by individual. Some got better and some got worse, right? And, and I think that's very typical. I don't know, um, I think I have a little bit more time. So, uh, say a few words about skull defects. Should TDCS be adjusted in skull defects? Yes, because you have a hole in your skull and your skull is normally very resistive. Um, but in terms of the how, it really depends on the nature of the defect. So what this is, what you're looking at now, this is not, a, these are not, this is not different individuals with um, different defects. This is one head model with idealized defects, so we created virtual damage. Uh, and then we made little holes, and we made big holes, and we filled those holes with nothing. Uh, so it, was, it would be soft tissue, we filled it with ceramic, which is very uh, insulated, we filled it with metal plates, and then we simulated, this is an example of what you can do with models, we simulated TDCS on the subject. And we found many interesting things, but um, here's one of them. So if the hole is right under your active electrode, it acts like a funnel. And all the current goes right into that hole. And, and the scale is different. This is 2.5 and that's 0.6. So the yellow here is much more intense than the yellow there. Now, it is a good thing. I mean, maybe you, that was the region that you wanted to affect for rehabilitation. It must, it must necessarily, it's a bad thing. But certainly, if you look at the top, you can't use efficacy and safety data from healthy without consideration of the adjustments necessary. But if the hole is in the middle, and this is just an empty hole uh, with filled with conductive fluid. If you compare this figure to the healthy head, they look very similar. And so it's, it's, and the reason for that is because this hole is right in between the anode and the cathode. And as a result, it's not a preferential entry or exit point. Anyways, we looked at many, many other permutations. And so the, the answer is, it, it, that's why I said it depends, uh, but not in a way that's like unknown. The models will tell you. Uh, what you need to be aware of, what are worst case scenarios. This is an example with a large defect. Here you can see there's a huge defect under the pad, but there's not a lot of current under the pad. It's all right on the edge. And the reason is because it's a plate, and the current enters the plate and then runs along the plate. So in that case, you're actually sparing the brain. So there's this, you know, you, right now, you know, a lot of times skull defects are straight out counter indication for TDCS. If you need to go down that road, however, uh, you have um, the models to do it. Um, stroke, you know, uh, the, the, the brain after stroke is by definition not the same as before. And what was our, I was surprised to learn about this stuff is first of all how large these like blowouts can be, right? Sometimes, this is not even an extreme example. Uh, the second thing I was surprised to learn was that the brain actually cannibalizes what is in there if there's anything left, so you're effectively left with CSF. And so what you have is brain with this pocket of CSF, which is very conductive compared to the brain. <coughs> um, and again, I know this is about neuropsychiatric disorders, so I don't know how much interest there is in stroke here, but if there's some, the bottom line is that when you do TCS on people with stroke, um, even if you give them the same dose as you would give a person with an intact brain, the brain current flow will not be the same because their brains are not different. They're, they're very different. Here you can see the, the, the blowout. Uh, it's filled with CSF. And again, I'm flying through a lot of stuff, but this, this, all this stuff has been published. And it turned out that th their target was actually here for whatever reason, right? Everyone has their, 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 like, you know, their flavor, right? That in stroke, they think this is the excited pivot, right? That's the other thing I've learned. But this was their target, and they wanted to excite it. I don't mean to be, I don't know what it is, but, you know, I, obviously it's rigorous work, but you know, everyone has a different target. 
in this case, this was the target, and the goal was to excite it. And so they put the anode over the target, and you can see where the anode is. And they went as far as to do fMRI on every single subject to individualize the dose. So this was not like a naive effort. But they put the electrode over the target. And one of the things, one of my, the, my themes is, putting an electrode over a target does not give, is not the same thing as stimulating the target. And in this case, it completely missed the target. The current actually flushed around. Uh, but again, you, you, you can do better. And, and one approach is to use high definition electrodes, um, which, which I don't think these are not like 1% better. These can be categorically different effects. And in this case, the point is not the focality, because this, this, this clinical group does not care about focality. They're not so concerned about the, the side effects, necessarily, that you might get with this diffuse current flow. But they do want to get their target. So in this case, by using something very simple, in this case, it's a 4x2, because there's two anodes, and you put up the surround, you can actually hit that gyri very effectively. Uh, and then, again, with, <coughs> with uh, the company that I work with, Soterix, they ran a, um, a prospective trial where they compared every subject got individualized optimization, or they got the sponge pad, and they, you know, they did a crossover uh, to see who would do better. Um, uh, and it, it worked out that you know, the, the high definition did, did, did work better in whatever it was, seven out of eight subjects, but it was a very small study. Um, but it certainly proved that you, more importantly, I think, than the clinical outcome, it proved that if you want to adjust your dose based on, and you have something with stroke and you want to adjust it, you can. You can, you know what I mean? And, or you can not. Um, um, This, I guess since I have the slide, um, this was just a, this was a study, it was another, it was another group, um, uh, Lockheed worked with Alvaro as well. This was in vision rehabilitation, so the, the, the stroke was in the back. This is the model of it, and they put the um, excitatory electrode over it and returned here. And as you can already imagine, this is not stimulating just this little spot, you're stimulating a lot of the brain. What was interesting in the study for me was that they did fMRI during a relevant task, uh, pre-rehabilitation and post-rehabilitation. And the sub